Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever in the world you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the very last day of the Dream to Travel Festival. Today, we're going to have a fireside chat with Chloe Lim, who is the Director of Global Business Marketing at Facebook's Asia Pacific. Uh, Chloe, thank you very much for joining us today. A uh, quick introduction of our guest speaker. Chloe is involved in leading all of Facebook's B2B marketing activities across its family of brands, including Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp. Uh, bef before, prior to her job at Facebook, Chloe held a range of senior executive roles in marketing and general management capacities. She was the senior director Asia Marketing at PayPal. And before that, she was the Group Vice President of Orbits Worldwide, where she was the Managing Director of Hotel Club and its three businesses, hotelclub.com, ratestogo.com, and asiahotels.com, across, e, uh, across APEC and the Americas. Thank you very much for joining us today, Chloe. Would you like to say a few words before we begin? No, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so privileged to be here, to be able to speak to everybody. Uh, as you mentioned, I head up global business marketing for Facebook and all our family of brands across APAC. And I'm just excited to be here to share some of my stories with all of you. Looking forward to the chat. Thank you so much for being here today with us. We also have Ekaterina, our Pada Youth co-host. She's all the way based in Mexico right now. I'm going to hand over the time to her, but before I do, I do want to remind you guys that we have a Q&A right at the end of this session. So if Chloe says anything and a question pops into your brain, please use the Q&A function down below so that we can answer all your questions at the end. So, Ekaterina, would you like to introduce yourself and get us started? Uh, yes, certainly, Ali. It's going to be my pleasure. So, welcome everybody to join our fireside chat. And my name is Ekaterina. I'm a PhD student in a Hong Kong Polytechnic University School of Hotel and Tourism Management. And I'm really glad to start our fireside chat with such an inspiring Chloe Lin today. <laughs> so, Chloe. Thank you again for joining. We are, we are more excited that you are. Uh, yes. <laughs> I know you have a very interesting story about your career. So could you please share a bit with us? How did your career in marketing start and grow? We really want to know the origin story. <laughs> I know when you say origin story, it makes me feel like a superhero, but, but I'm not, but I'm very happy to share my career journey. And I also want to just thank Ekaterina. I know where you're based. It's really late your time. So thank you so much for taking time to really host this session with us as well. So um, I actually took the road that is less traveled. When I graduated, most of my classmates ended up joining well-established brands as well as maybe the big four. At that point of time, I chose to join an internet startup. Uh, and I probably am revealing my age a little bit. Internet wasn't a thing at that point of time. I spent a lot of time explaining to my family and friends what, my com what the company did, what I was doing. But it definitely started me on a journey with startups and it gave me a whole world of opportunity. In my first role, actually within a year, I packed up and left for Hong Kong. At that point of time, I didn't come from a privileged background. In fact, we didn't have a lot of money. So I didn't have a passport. I have never even traveled overseas. But I said yes to my boss and I moved to Hong Kong. And that essentially started my career. I had my first part of my career, I would say, is all in startups. I've been in three. I was very fortunate because they were great companies and they were all sold. In my last startup, I think just now you, you kind of talked a little bit about it. The last startup that I was in was OTA in Australia. I started out running the global marketing functions and we had presence in about 16 countries um, in Europe, all across Asia Pacific. Then after the acquisition, we ended up selling the company. I ended up running the business for about four years before heading into early retirement. I know, I know what everybody's thinking. You're, it seems very young and I was very green at that point of time. I hit it into early retirement. And then a few years into that, I decided that it was my next chapter. Uh, I'm actually from Singapore. At a point of time, I've been living in Australia for a long time. Uh, for personal reasons, I actually fell pregnant and wanted to come back to Singapore. And I thought if I want to do something back in Singapore, I wanted to go back to marketing, which is my first love. I was very fortunate. PayPal was looking for somebody to lead their marketing team in Asia. 
and they were also going through an IPO period after splitting from eBay. So it was very much a startup environment. I'm so proud of what we did with PayPal. It's a great company, but the next adventure awaits. So I had the wonderful opportunity to join Facebook and lead business marketing for all our brands. I've been with Facebook for, I think, about 20 months now. It's an incredible mission-led organization with some really talented people. So that's kind of my career journey. It's one of two halves from startup to big tech companies. That actually sounds like a really great journey. It's like you mentioned your marketing was your first love, but I'm sure you fall in love several times through your career path. Yeah. And could you share a little bit more about um, what do you like as a leader? So do you have your kind of own manifesto or something? I well, whether it's a manifesto, but given that we're marketers, I'll talk about the three P's that it's a guiding, almost like a guiding principle to me. I think the first thing, the first P is about people. We spend a lot of time at work and some of us will probably say too much. Uh, and there is, there are economic reasons why we work, right? But I also firmly believe that as humans, as people, we want to learn. We want to enjoy work. In fact, work is a very deep form of self-actualization. It makes us feel satisfied and happy. And I think as leaders, when you have uh, team members, you have employees, we have a responsibility to our people. So being people first, people orientation is very, very important to me. So that's kind of the first thing that is my guiding light. The second thing is actually principles. What are the principles that I uh, hold myself at? In every company that I have been in with every team, I normally share my commitment to the team. And sometimes it might be different because currently I have shared at my principles with my existing team. In fact, when somebody new joins the team, I talk to them about it. It gets posted very publicly to my, so that they know what I'm about as a leader. So I'm happy to kind of really share that with you if you don't mind, because it might, it might sound like um, I'm reading, but I thought it might be being, uh, five things. The first thing is I will always be open and direct with you, but not directive. And I'll always speak with care. Know that I'm your ally that I will have your back and I will support you. The third point is, I will always listen to you and I will understand you. But please know that I will also push you and challenge you when needed. Uh, the fourth point is, I will ensure marketing has a seat at the table so that marketing is considered a core business driver. And we will co-create the most amazing work and the most amazing team to make this a world-class marketing function. So these are some of the principles that I share with my team to be really open about how I think about them and what my responsibilities are to them. Uh, the last P, interestingly, is pliability. I get asked a lot, hey, what's your leadership style? And to me, leadership style has to ebb and flow based on the people that you work with. Um, to bring out the best in people, we have to adapt our styles because each individual is different. So there are people in my team where you tell them, hey, this is the end result we want to achieve. And they want to figure their way out there. And they want complete autonomy. Uh, I have other people that I've worked with where they're very committed, but along that process, they want to check in. They want to understand your point of view and they want to defer to you or have conversations with you. So those are different styles and your leadership style will have to adapt according to that. So, so for me, it's really about making people front and center and being people first, making sure that you have principles and communicate them to your team and then really having a flexible, pliable leadership style. I hope that helps to give you an understanding of what type of leader I am. I think that's, uh, that's a really clear vision that you have for uh, what you want to do as a leader with your team. And thank you so much for that. I think it's also such a marketing thing to do, to have like three Ps and present <laughs> them that way. <laughs> but I think what, why we really wanted to ask you that question on leadership is because when we were stalking you on LinkedIn, all the recommendations were just like, Chloe's the most amazing leader. Chloe has like led such a great team. And all the recommendations and the comments were about your leadership skills. So that's why we really wanted to tap it, tap on your brain and see, and see it from your point of view. So thank you so much for that. I do have, I do have one follow-up question for the first point because you said, um, we want to enjoy work. We want to feel motivated and passionate about our work. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about this idea of work-life balance? Does that exist, not exist? What is it to you? It's a, it's a really interesting one. I think about work-life balance as work-life integration for me. 
right? Because when you talk about work-life balance, it feels like there is tension. And as I mentioned earlier, we all work not just for economic reasons, but we work for satisfaction as well. So I think that's very important. So I don't think about it in my mindset. I don't think about it as a tension point. It's something that has equilibrium to me. So I think that's the, the, the first thing. I don't see them as tensioned. And for me, I'm very fortunate. I always think about what is a priority to me. So family is very important to me. Then my responsibility to my team is really important to me. So if you can find the priority and the focus areas that is most critical to you, I think then you'll prioritize that most effectively and then you will move away from the tension points. So work-life balance, I think a lot of people feel it's quite difficult, particularly right now when many people are still working from home. So where do you kind of draw the line? To me, it's not that, uh, to me, it hasn't been that different even though um, the environmental has, the environmental areas have changed. It's really defining what is your priority and then making sure that that is top of the list. And mine is very simple. I'm actually very happy, just to give you a sense of how my day works. And because I have, I report to the US and I have teams across all across um, Asia, and I have a lot of counterparts in Europe as well. So if you think about it, I could be working 24 hours, but that's not what I choose to do, right? So I have a pretty flexible work day. Uh, to me, flexibility is really important because the two things that are important to me is I want to be there for my work and I want to be there for the family. So. On the days, so I'm very fortunate on the days where I have calls, I will probably finish up at three o'clock and I'll have a cuddle with the kids. I'll take them swimming. I'll do some exercise. So as long as I've spent time with the kids, I can do some exercise and I'm actually quite happy. So that's, but that's kind of the criteria for me to be happy and back and have work life integration. So I normally suggest to people, uh, the first thing is uh, find what is a priority for you first and then structure kind of your work and your life around that. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I think it gives me like a new understanding of how to think about work-life balance instead of constantly trying to fight this tension. Yeah, it's really good advice. Thank you. That help inspires a lot to think about a proper life balance. So it's <laughs> very inspiring. Um, our next question is something that we've been wanting to ask. Um, and it's a really important question. Mm. How can we get more young Asian women in leadership positions? What needs to be done by youths who want these leadership positions and by the companies? It's an interesting one because not too long ago, I was also a young Asian woman. <laughs> Obviously, this is, still a are, still are. <laughs> this is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, APAC, is a really dynamic region. And I'm actually glad that we have been rapidly evolving, if you think about it, both economically and socially. So that's the good thing. The challenge here though, is that gender gap still remains. I think we all know that. To me, one of the key things though is unfortunately, I'll say that it's unfortunately, women's relatively low representation in leadership position is unfortunately not just an APEC issue. It's one that is global, right? So it's not just, Talk, but it's not just a problem that we face here, but one that is global. So I think um, McKenzie has a power of parity report uh, for Asia Pacific for every four men in leadership position, I think there is only one. So we have made strides, I would say, for APEC, given how quickly we have evolved. Um, it is still the issue that needs attention. So I'm 100% uh, with you. And it's something that I personally have lived through. At the same time, I think, uh, countries, APEC, I always tell people, APEC is not one country. <laughs> there are many countries in APEC and the countries are very diverse. And I want to make sure that, and I'm very sensitive, we don't over, it may be too simplistic to overgeneralize the situation or the root causes. So I'll talk a little bit about my personal perspective, is that you probably could hear from what I've just said is there are many reasons, including maybe sometimes unconscious bias in developed markets where you think, hey, men and women have equal education. Why are women still not in leadership position or fewer number? It, there might be unconscious bias. In other countries, it could be access to education. There might be unchanged societal expectations. Women are supposed to do certain things, for example. And then of course, there are policies. They are much wider ranging from governments or companies. So just now you asked about, hey, what do we need to do to make change? And the reality is because it is a complex problem, right? But it's one that is so important to tackle. Change must happen across all levels, you know, from the top, from governments, from companies, and of course, from individuals. Um, probably, um, 
talking about companies and individuals might be something kind of I can talk about. I think for company, and the good news is many companies take diversity and gender parity issues very seriously, and companies need to do that. We need to continue to drive equality and then take action. I think the first thing about it is we need to acknowledge that there is an issue. And then we need to take action and be really accountable for it. If we're not doing good enough, it's okay. We can keep working on it. So being accountable is really important. And there are a lot of programs now that many companies are undertaking, right? For example, we might require diverse slates for recruiting. So you need to have men and women when you're doing hiring. You do training for managers, unconscious bias training, and you create programs of advocacy, mentorship program to be allies to women, to recognize that you can be a woman ally and you can be a male ally. So I think companies, there's a lot of things that companies can do, but the first thing is acknowledge it, take action, then take accountability, measure it, and see what else we can do better. So I think that's on a high level, on company level. Uh, on individuals as well, I think there's a lot that we can do, both as uh, women and men, kind of being allies, be, be mentors, sponsors, um, allies for women, be an advocate for women, join initiatives that foster equality. And sometimes it is as simple as creating conversations so that we can start talking about it and creating awareness because that's always the first step. And then we can help educate. So for individual, I always think that sometimes things can feel very big, but we can start small. Creating conversation is helpful. Um, advocating, sponsoring, standing up for women is important and then joining initiatives. So hopefully this kind of gives you a perspective in terms of how I'm thinking about it. And I know we've made strides, but there's more that could be done. And hopefully across all levels, we can come together because I think everybody have heard about this, right? Uh, this phrase, women's rights is human rights. Mm. <laughs> so it's really important for, for us to make this happen. Yeah, it's also one of the SDGs that, uh, one of the SDG goals, gender equality. And it's something that as, as a region, as a country, we all need to work towards and not just kind of sweep it under the rug, pretending that every, pretending that just because we're better than what it used to be in the past means we're already there. Maybe we're not there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for your very well thought out answer. I think we can truly see like the passion shine through, especially for this topic. And it's really something that I want to work on as well, making sure that, for example, today we have an all female panel. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I, I think that what is wonderful, one of the key things I say is um, sometimes the issue may seem very big, but we can start small. And even here, just creating conversation and talking about it is actually helping us drive awareness, educate, and hopefully somewhere in the audience when somebody's thinking about this, they'll go, I'm going to have that conversation. I'm going to join the initiative. I might start an initiative. That's really important as well. So I think that's the first step, just driving awareness listening and understanding and then we can move forward hmm. i also want to say i have so much faith in the next generation <laughs> to really Me push too. forward and push through because they've actually already demonstrated to us how passionate they can be about issues like uh climate change and gender equality and i really yeah. see change happening so i'm i'm really excited for the future <laughs> Me too. I, I think so i think youth has such a critical role to influence uh, the process of achieving gender equality, right? Uh, for the youth who are online and listening, you are the leaders of tomorrow, right? So we're very hopeful that you'll be, we'll be able to make this right and it will, will achieve gender parity in the near future. Yeah. Our next question dives straight into like this realm of marketing. Um, so I've, I would love to work for Facebook. I would love to be the next marketing hit for Facebook when you're ready to step down. What do I have to do to get there? Of course, this is like a hypothetical situation, but really we want a little bit of career advice for the youth who want a career in marketing. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I love it. I love it. You know, I love that it's so important for us to have aspirations, right? Because just now we talk about, I talk about self-actualization is one of the things you need to have passion, whether it's a hobby or the work that you do. So I think it's important to have aspirations. It's important to have goals. And frequently I do talk to my team about, hey, what is your aspirations? What do you want to do? What is the end goal? What would you feel really happy and satisfied? And importantly, how you get there. So uh, interestingly, 
uh, I think my career advice to my team and to use are not that different. So I share my, let me share my philosophy. To me, it's a triangulation of three things. One is very important, your aspirations. You do need to know what you want to do. You do need to know what would make you really happy, excited. So aspirations is very important. And I know you might be thinking, hey, surely everybody knows what their aspiration is. But you know, it's a more difficult question than you think. And the second part is you need to know your strengths. So your skill sets. What are you really good at? What gives you energy? And what you could do really, really well. And the third area is actually a little bit more out of your control, which is based on the company that you want to be in or the industry. Sometimes we can be a bit broader that you want to be in. What roles do they need? What skill sets do they need? What are they looking for? What are the opportunities there? So generally, I find when somebody is really successful, all those three elements come together. And let me give you some examples. So for example, if you have aspirations, you want to be uh, in this particular role. And there is a company or industry that has a need for this role. But what, where there is a gap is where there's strengths. You don't have the technical skills maybe, or you lack the experience. Then you know that, hey, how I need to get there is I need to work on my strengths. And sometimes you might have the aspirations and you have the skill set. But the company that you might be working in or the industry that you might be working in may not be able to use the skill sets that you have or they may not have opportunity for you. And when that happens, I normally tell the person, maybe it's time to move on to the next company. Have you thought about changing different industries, right? And there are certain times you can't even get started because you know what your strengths are. You're working in a company or industry that you're really happy, but you're going, I'm not quite sure what I want to do. So to me, I always find the triangulation of those three things are really important. And you know what's the great thing about this? Two out of the three are dependent on you, right? Mm. You, you find out what makes it tick for you. You build your strengths. You understand your strengths and build your skills. And in fact, I will even say that the company and the opportunity for the, from the company or industry also lies from, with you because you need to, you have the opportunity to find out what company works for you, what type of industry is suitable for you and what opportunities there are. So a large part of this, we actually have control over. So hopefully this will help um, uh, the youths that are listening to this session think about, you know, What's next? How do I get to the next step? How do I build my career? I hope that's helpful. It is. It is definitely helpful. It was like practical steps to get your dream job. <laughs> yes. But I'm just wonder. I guess a lot of participants who listen to this uh, uh, chat and join us today, they're already thinking about pursuing career in marketing. They have some companies in mind. Hopefully, they know what they want and they have the particular you know, strength that I needed in this industry. But I think what we would like your help in is to make kind of a reality check, you know? So are there some assumptions about marketing, about working in marketing, which you want to correct? You know, for example, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of examples you can share, like everyone is a, everyone can be uh, in marketing and so on. So could you please provide this reality check for us? So oh. we know what it is. Oh, myths about marketing. Oh, there are so many. Like there's so many myths about marketing. You know, just now you, you talk about some. So frequently, I think people think marketing is really fluffy. You can't measure it. Like you just put out something and something magically will happen. Sometimes for the people who are much more money oriented, they think, oh, it's a cost center. You don't drive revenue with marketing. But the one that comes up so frequently and you talked about it is that everyone is a marketer and everybody can be a marketer. I, I think one of the interesting things is we see marketing everywhere and every day, right? If you think about it, you're, you're hearing a piece of content, you're reading something, you are seeing an ad. So it's ubiquitous, right? So because of that ubiquity, there is misconception of what marketing is. If I can give an opinion about an advertisement that I just saw, if I can comment about a piece of content, if I can put a video of myself online, I must be a marketer. <laughs> I think that's kind of one of the key uh, misconceptions or myths to me. And to me, having been in marketing for over 20 years, it is actually a deeply technical skill that people, like you need very deep technical skills that people don't realize. But on the more kind of macro level, you have to build marketing strategies. You have to build PL, manage budgets. You have to think about driving core business metrics. In some jobs, you have to deal with new customer acquisition. So that's kind of all the bigger, more macro stuff. And then you go into the more granular macro stuff, which is how do you launch a customer research? 
How do you use big data to understand customer insights? How do you create programmatic digital programs? So I don't know how many words you picked up, like the, the people on the phone and online are picking up, but there's a lot of technical, deep technical knowledge required to make marketing effective. And in fact, it is also very coordinated. I think people think that we just dream up something and go run and do it. It's actually very coordinated and it needs a lot, a lot of planning. In fact, without technical knowledge, I'll probably say that the marketing will fail. Mm -hmm. And then think about it, there is also other complexities. Um, I don't know which discipline of marketing both of you are in, but there are actually many, many different disciplines. There is digital, there's research, there's media, creative, CRM, so on and so forth, right? And then within each discipline are sub-disciplines as well. So just take digital. Within digital itself, there's search marketing, there's social, influencer marketing, so on and so forth. So to me, this myth is, yeah, probably everyone can be a marketer, if they undertake the necessary training and time to develop the skill sets to do it. <laughs> so, you know, this is something that has come up to me many times uh, in and out of my uh, job. So it is something that I've uh, taught a lot about and spoken and discussed a lot about, but um, we've, we've come a long way from, um, we've come a long way actually. I think it's, it's so funny because you said, um, deep technical knowledge required and then you threw us a bunch of keywords <laughs> and I was just like yeah yeah I can't do this <laughs> you need like you really need an entire marketing team behind you so I think like all the marketing teams that are out there and listening to you right now and to your rent they're all like yes <laughs> this is true it was intentional so I hope you don't mind when, when I kind of heard this question Question, like the first thing I was like, oh, people don't think it's technical. It, they, they think that we come in, we, um, we go for very long lunches, we have law, launch parties, and we magically dream up some ideas that we kind of bring to the press or media, and the reality is very different. Mm. <laughs> That's, that's definitely not true for a career in marketing. It's not all about the champagne flutes and the launch parties. You know, it's a funny one because I, I think there is a perception that is very glamorous as well. Maybe not for all forms of marketing, but I think there is a perception that there is glamour. I was saying, you know, I think when people think about marketing, particularly in some of the disciplines, right? Like if you were in a creative agency mm. or a media agency that our days are really, or if you launch products, our days are filled with product launches, launch parties, launch parties, uh, lunches. Uh, but I would probably say the, the reality, like, it's it's much more practical and harsher. Right? <laughs> so just now I talk about all the need for those technical skills because on top of those technical skills um, with technology, things change very quickly. So you have to hone it and you have to work very hard at it. Mm. And the other thing that I get people to think about when they say they want a career in marketing is that, hey, imagine in the connected world that we live in, what you put out is for all to see and critique. Right? So I always get people to think about, imagine all the SMS messages that you have, all your WhatsApp messages, or all your emails are suddenly for the whole world to see and critique. Mm. How does it make you feel? So I always tell people there's a sense of responsibility, and for some people it could be stress, to make sure that you represent your business, your product, and your services appropriately, because it is so open for everybody to see. So it's not easy, if you think about it. And then I'd probably say, yes. The reality is there is lunch and there are events, but organizing and working an event is not the same as going out for a meal with your friends. <laughs> I think that's the key thing. You, you have fun, but in a different way because it is very coordinated and you need to hit very specific objectives. And um, the other thing I hate to burst people's bubbles, uh, lunches and events are less frequent than one might think. Uh, most of the time, I, I'll confess, like yesterday, all I did was work on my computer and spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations and approve information on my um, computer. So, so it's probably less glamorous than what people would think. So, so I hope this is not a rant because just so I heard you say, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, I love marketing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. It's so fun. It's fulfilling. Uh, it's, uh, if you love, if you are a creative person, it's great because you get to think outside the box. If you're a person who loves collaboration, it's great because you get to work with many, many people and you build impactful programs. And if you're in industry, if you're in an industry uh, and you're part of the marketing team, generally you're at the forefront of trends. So all those are true. 
<laughs> they're not missed, but it does come with very hard work. So I just want to kind of precede that so that people don't feel, oh my God, it's so frightening to go into marketing. It's not, it's amazing, but it is hard work. I think your passion really shows through for marketing and, and I love it. I personally love it. I love being nerdy of over big data and like going down into the small technical details. It's amazing. Ekaterina has a question about marketing. Uh, yes, I just had one more assumption, which uh, I always wonder uh, what's your position about it. So do you think small companies can also compete with large players on the market? I mean, for marketing and digital marketing and so on. So it's also what your perception for smaller companies, for startups and so on. So can they really compete with big players? Yeah, this question is important to us because a lot of our community mm -hmm. has given up on finding a job and it's just going to be their own boss as an entrepreneur. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know that I have, um, being in startups and being an entrepreneur has a very special place in my heart for, because for that's how I got my start. And for a large period of time, that was kind of all I thought I was going to do. This is a great question. And I love to pivot into uh, something really practical and people are thinking about it. I think we live in a very connected world right now. And um, I think one of the beauties of technology, I'll start from the customer side first, because if you want to be in business, you have to think about customer first, right? So with technology, customers are very informed about products and services. Suddenly you get access to customers and customers use technology, get to understand, engage and talk to businesses. So alongside that, technology has really democratized and leveled the playing field for businesses. So I think that's the amazing part of the world that we live in. If you think about years ago, if you want to launch a brand, you will probably need millions of dollars to go in a very traditional route, but that has changed dramatically over the last decade. Now, small brands and established brands, to be honest, because technology is not for one or the other, it's for both kind of big and small companies alike now, you have, we have the opportunity to meaningful challenge and inspire each other because this level, this playing field has never been more leveled. I wanted to share a stat that I read that was I found really interesting. So heavyweight, so all the big brands used to spend about 33 years on the S&P 500. Right now, that forecast is coming down to about 14 years. So I think about it, it used to be 33 years, now it's 14. So they're being replaced by other companies. So the truth is that this is a great indication of leveling of playing field, right? We've seen meaningful products and services and new companies come in every year. So I just want everybody to think about it. Think about all the services and products that you most commonly use now. 10 years ago, were you using them? <laughs> right? Those are all new companies that came about and kind of they, some have grown very large and some of them are still working kind of in a very niche way. But I've actually, I personally feel that with technology that this leveling field, this playing field has been level. And I think that's amazing that we can have uh, small brands contribute really meaningfully, small or uh, medium-sized businesses brands contribute really meaningfully. And I also think that that's probably a reason why we have seen niche brands that are very successful right now everywhere in different industries so what a great question and I, I can't wait to see kind of next 10 years what's going to happen next um we have we have a few questions from our audience so we're going to dive straight into the q a section right now um and i really like this question because then it kind of ties back to your passion about startups uh mm. what was your biggest career takeaway from starting out in startups did that give you an advantage over your classmates who went straight to the bigger companies? I think, I, I wouldn't say advantage because our experience is very different. But one of the things that I learned in my startup life was I changed really my perspective and my mindset. So I truly had a growth mindset, right? The way, because when you're in a startup, one, there is no template in terms of how you're building. Nobody's giving you any rules. You just know, hey, where you want to get to. And you generally, for most startups, when you first start off, you have very little resources, both on money and people. So you have to be super creative and you have to iterate very quickly. So I've thrown out a few things, but what is common to that is you have, a, you have to have a mindset that is growing 
and how you encounter failure, how do you iterate and change is very different. So to me, that was what that built in my DNA. I was never frightened. If somebody tells me, hey, you have to do something right now and there's no template for it, I was never fearful. A lot of my um, team members always tell me, Chloe, you're fearless. And I, don't, I didn't realize that was fearless until uh, when I went into much more structured uh, organizations and I realized that it was a mindset that I had with, in startups. I was not afraid to fail. And if we did something wrong, we'll pivot very quickly. I was never afraid to um, do something different and that really shaped my DNA. So I think that's kind of the first thing. And I always say that mindset is key because when you have two people having the same experience, you will approach things very differently. And the person who is resilient and have a growth mindset will tend to be happier in many ways than a person who is not satisfied to take failure very difficultly. So, so I feel that's very important. So that set my DNA. Uh, the second thing, my the second takeaway, which I talked a lot about earlier, was really working as a team. No person is an island. And if you think about just some we were talking about marketing, so no, no one is an island. For something to be really successful in a company, you need every single function to work. And even if you are in marketing, you need to work with all the other functions to launch a program as well. So working together with the team is incredibly important. Being people oriented is incredibly important because collaboration is everything, right? So, and the, the ability to collaborate, to be able to influence, to be able to solve problems together is what's very important because everybody has different functional expertise as well. So I think the ability to collaborate is really important. And you might say that, hey, it's probably the same in big companies and a startup. I will say in startup, the pressure is a little bit different because again, you have more restrictions on budgets, and uh, human resources as well. And you have to make very quick pivots because sometimes you could run out of money. <laughs> so everybody coming together, working as a team and hitting your objective. I like that gave me a way, that gave me a true uh, view of if you work as a team, you could do anything. When for the OTA that was in Australia, we started out so small and by the time we sold, and by the time I left the company, it was more than 300 people. I wouldn't have never expected that. And we went through some of the most difficult times ever imaginable to me at that point of time. And we flourished. And it wasn't something magical. It was just us working as a team. So I think kind of, to me, is that mindset that was a big takeaway. And the second thing is people and working as a team. Thank you so Thank much for that. Um, that was an excellent answer to an excellent question. <laughs> Great question. Hi, Katrina, do you want to choose our next question? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, it's actually a question that was joined, that was shared in the chat at the uh, middle of the session. Yes, I believe from Anjana Sanun Kumar. Yes, thank you. You got a lot of compliments to Chloe, certainly. Yes, and thanks for interesting chat that we have. And so uh, Anjana shared that oftentimes youth is overlooked just for the fact of being young and, and experienced. So, uh, and she would like to hear your views on, the, uh, on this point. So the youth is overlooked with the excuse of being young and unexperienced. How you can support youth? Got it, got it. I, I think, it, can I paraphrase the question to make sure that I got it correct? So when youths are going for job interviews, they feel like they're overlooked, right? Because they do not have the necessary experience. Okay, great. I, I think this correlates to, I can't speak for everybody, but whenever we have a role that we're hiring. One is we have a job description, right? <laughs> so when you think about it, we, there are certain things that we look for, for roles. And there are many, many facets. And I probably say that there's two things. Uh, generally, you will need technical skills and you will need soft skills. And technical skills is dependent on the role. And sometimes you may not need working experience. It could be actual hands-on experience or it could be a degree. So it depends on the role. So I look at, for example, if you think about digital marketing, uh, understanding digital media is really important, right? So you might be somebody who's fresh out of school, but you actually know social media channels very well, you know search engine marketing very well. 
and you're able to interpret data, or you might have a degree that allows you to understand analytics for big data. So technical skills is really important because the reality is in order to do a job, you need technical skills. So, so it just depends on the level of the role. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is actually soft skills and they don't ever go out of style. So to me, there are a couple of soft skills that I would normally look for whether you have experience or you don't have experience. And again, of course, you will never hire um, some, if you're looking for somebody deeply experienced, um, you shouldn't be asking a fresh graduate to come into the, to the interview because that will be out of kilter. But certainly, um, uh, if you have the proper job description, people will come in and you'll match them according to the jobs. But the soft skills are really important. I, I wanted to talk a few because I think um, they are something that I t tell myself about as well. I think the first thing is uh, communication skills. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about marketing, but non-marketing as well. So I think communication skills for marketers are critical. Ultimately, we are storytellers. We tell stories to inform, educate, change behavior, create understanding, create excitement, inspire, right? So it's fundamental. It can be written verbal on frequently both. But even if you're not a marketer, in every single job function, you will have to communicate to somebody either internally or externally. So having good communication skills is actually really important. The second thing I think I talked a little bit about earlier, which is collaboration. You work in teams and you're stronger together. No matter what you do, whether you're a programmer, you're in product, you're in sales, you're a marketer, you have to work with other teams. <laughs> so internal or external. So being able to collaborate, influence, work effectively is really, really important. So when you're in an interview uh, environment, kind of how you communicate, how you demonstrate collaboration are all very important. The third one uh, is to me critical as well, particularly for um, young graduates or people with um, who are building their career is commercial awareness. And what do I mean by that is you need to have an understanding of the industry and the company that you want to work for. Somebody with understanding who have done their homework of the industry and the company is much more desirable than those who don't. We expect you to do your homework because we want to see passion. And we also want to understand that you understand what the company is about, what the industry is about. Remember the triangulation <laughs> that I talked about before you apply for the role, right? So I think those three things are really important. And then the last one is for me personally. So this is specific to me. I don't know other people, if other people look at it. I talked about growth mindset earlier, and that's really important to me. And I also think it's because of the company and the type of companies I've always worked in. So being flexible, being able to respond to failure. So I love asking people, hey, when something goes wrong, how do you respond to it? Being able to think outside the box, being tenacious, being resilient are all really kind of important qualities to me. So I know I didn't kind of completely answer that question, but I wanted to raise that um, you don't have to be overlooked, but there are two components that are really important. Make sure that you have the skill sets to do the job and two, make sure that you have the soft skills that are always critical, no matter what role you are in. And to be honest, no matter what level of seniority and what level of experience you have. Right? To me, I find that they are table sticks. That's it. The question. Perfect. It's a perfect guideline how to prepare, you know, for job hunting. So first, you know your skills, then you know what kind of company you need. You do your homework, which is very important, and make sure you feel passionate about it and you want to grow there. I think it's, it's a perfect answer. I'm, I'm, I, and also, it's very inspiring. But uh, I do have like a little question on top of this one. For example, you see a fresh graduate uh, and you interview this fresh graduate and soft skills, let's say you got convinced. But in terms of the knowledge, let's say big data analysis, the only experience is only a diploma and certificates and maybe some school projects. How, this, how I can convince you that I actually can deliver the job or uh, this, I think, something that the youth and fresh graduates feel a lot of challenge with. Mm. Hey, it's a good question. One of the things that I wanted to highlight, and I, just now I talk about before, generally, before most companies, um, I won't say it's for all companies, but at least the companies that I've worked in, before we actually even post a job ad, we would think about the level of experience that we want. Because you're thinking, creating a team right and you're you're not always looking at hiring at people at 
different levels because you also need to do talent pipeline in your team. So sometimes you're hiring for leadership positions. So somebody to lead a team would have 10, 15, 20 years of experience and have to be subject matter experts. And sometimes you're hiring more junior team members so that they can grow into their roles and they could, and sometimes you'll be hiring fresh graduates. So I think one of the things that is really important is that really, so most companies will do this. They will identify in their job description what is the level of experience that they need. And frequently, it will be very challenging. If a company is looking for somebody with eight years experience, very specific skill sets, and you're going, hey, I'll have a go at it. Um, sometimes it may happen, never say never, but the reality is that you, it, it will probably be more challenging. So I said the first thing is that is to be really practical and realistic. Going back to that triangulation, right? What does the organization need? Does the organization, are they in looking for somebody that is fresh from school and the reality is we, we have people who we hire people fresh from school as well in very specific roles and is that role suitable for me so I, I think that's the first card that there is so matching people is really important because that's the first part before you can go, even go into kind of having that conversation right so mm -hmm. so I always think that that for most good companies they will start to do that uh, does that make sense I, I know uh, I may not answer the question specifically but I wanted to address uh, normally, it wouldn't create attention if there is that that there is a matching there. It's very clear, and it's nice also to like you gave us a tip that we should keep an eye on the job description that most companies indicate that they look for fresh graduates. So it's uh, yes, it's a, yes, it's a great advice. It saves a lot of time, I think. <laughs> yes, I, I think so. <laughs> Chloe, I just, I just wanted to say thank you for the practical advice that's really going to keep our feet grounded and mm -hmm. our hearts passionate about the different issues that we've talked about today. We are running slightly over time, so I do have to end the conversation. I'm so sorry. I think this has been such a fruitful conversation. I have learned a lot from you. Thank you so much for your time today. Echo Trina, thank you so much for hosting today as well. Um, I, it's just been such a pleasure to be able to learn from you and to be able to um, hopefully model hopefully model my leadership skills after you as well. So, so we can all make the world a better place one step at a time. No, thank you so much. I am so grateful and feel very privileged to be able to share my experience with uh, everybody. Thank you so much, both of you, for hosting the session as well. I really enjoyed myself and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And the chat, the chat is full of people from all over the world, by the way, from like Bangladesh, Philippines, Guam, who are all just like, they're all just saying like, you're amazing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody's so generous. I'm just so excited that you found the information uh, valuable and fruitful. And um, I, I'm very passionate about supporting young people, particularly people who are underprivileged, given the background that I've been in. So i um, super excited that I can contribute in a small way as well. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Okay, so this fireside chat was possible because we are part of the Dream to Travel Festival that Pada is doing. Today is actually the last day of the festival. We've had an amazing four weeks learning and traveling to new places and just speaking and connecting with our international community. So um, if you do have any questions about the Pada Youth Program or how to get in contact with the get in contact with the community, this is my email address. You can find more information on how to join our community at www.pada.org/ytt. So. Um, Coming up next for our um, Dream to Travel later today at 1.30 p.m. Bangkok time. This is something that I'm so excited about because I used to be in the art industry and this is actually an immersive art experience um, situated in Macau by Team Lab. And so it's called, um, it's called, uh, nav okay, so the experience is this, okay? You're going to navigate the confluence of art, technology, and design and the natural world in this brand new body immersive art and space of the region, Team Lab Supernature. So this is a three-dimensional interactive space with varying elevations. So you get to go up, you get to go down, you get to explore the space, and it's huge. 
and everything is by the Art Collective Team Lab. Team Lab is amazing. I am so excited for this live experience. Um, please join us because there is a pub quiz at the end with a special giveaway prize package. It is an Air Macau round trip ticket. So all of you who have been dreaming to travel with us and really, really, really want to travel, this is the session to join us because with that round tri trip ticket, the prize also includes a one night stay at MGM Macau and a local tour. So I really want to go to Macau and eat egg tarts, but I'm not eligible for this prize, but you are. So please join us for this live experience later at 1.30 p.m. And that is it for me today. And that is it for the youth sessions of Pada's Dream to Travel. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us. It's been great. See you later in Macau. <laughs> Bye.